Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the VETA Medicare Alliance's State of Medicare Advantage virtual briefing. I'm Mary Beth Donahue, President and CEO of the VETA Medicare Alliance, and we're so glad to have you join us this afternoon. We have a great program for you, and in just a few minutes, I'm going to be joined by my colleague, Greg Gear, Vice President of Policy and Research here at VETA Medicare Alliance, and he's going to walk us through the State of Medicare Advantage report. Um, and then we have a terrific panel. Um, it, it, it'll be a discussion with three leaders on the front lines of serving Medicare Advantage seniors. And then after that, we're gonna open up the floor to hear from all of you um, and your questions. Um, but if you don't mind first, I do wanna just share a few words um, on Medicare Advantage um, before we dive into the panel and your questions. Today, Medicare Advantage is the coverage choice of more than 29 million seniors and individuals with disabilities. And the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office projects that Medicare Advantage could eclipse half of all Medicare enrollment as soon as next year. Our state of Medicare Advantage report points to some of the likely causes of this growth trend. Medicare Advantage beneficiaries save nearly 2,000 per year in total health costs compared to fee-for-service Medicare. And 99% of Medicare Advantage plans offer supplemental benefits to help seniors manage clinical and social needs. Medicare Advantage beneficiaries see lower rates of avoidable hospitalizations and readmissions. And last, Medicare Advantage beneficiaries give their coverage an overwhelming 94% satisfaction rate. Now, while not always top of mind for beneficiaries, important to many of you and our audience today is the fact that the government spends less than per, be less than per beneficiary in Medicare Advantage also. So as much as maybe sometimes and always seniors focus on their cost savings, we know many of you focus on the savings to the government. As our State of Medicare Advantage report shows, per member, per month spending is roughly $7 lower in Medicare Advantage than for beneficiaries of a similar health status in fee-for-service Medicare. These achievements in Medicare Advantage don't happen by accident. Medicare Advantage depends on continued support and stability from policymakers to maintain the lower costs, added benefits, and better outcomes that are hallmarks of the program today. Fortunately, bipartisan support for Medicare Advantage and the over 29 million Americans counting on it remains strong. Earlier this year, a record setting over 400 members of the House and the Senate came together to declare support for Medicare Advantage with bipartisan letters to CMS. And just last month, the Better Medicare Alliance amassed support from nearly 100 leading stakeholder groups in response to a recent request for information from CMS. Healthcare leaders ranging from the National Hispanic Medical Association to the Black Women's Health Imperative, the National Association of Manufacturers, Meals and Wheels America, the American Medical Group Association, the America's Physician Group, all sent letters to CMS affirming their support for the coverage and care that Medicare Advantage provides. And as you watch today's briefing and listen to our guest speakers, I hope that that you will also, if you haven't already taken action by joining these voices in support of Medicare Advantage beneficiaries. The fact is when policymakers stand up for Medicare Advantage, they stand up for their constituents' healthcare choices and for the quality affordable coverage they need and deserve. With that, I wanna be able to go on and continue our program. I know I'll be speaking um, and having some questions with our panel, but I wanna first turn to my colleague, Greg, our Vice President in Policy and Research. Um, so you take it away, Greg. Thanks so much, Mary Beth, and welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Very pleased to be here today um, to share the latest insights and analysis from the 2022 uh, State of Medicare Advantage report. Um, just a little background, this was released at the end of the summer. What the report does is provide a snapshot and analysis of the latest research and analysis on Medicare Advantage from independent studies, government reports, uh, the peer-reviewed literature, 
as well as BMA commissioned research. And what the data show really is a compelling story of success of a popular program that is delivering meaningful improvements to Medicare beneficiaries, whether it's in terms of cost savings, access to coverage and care, and improved health outcomes. And as Mary Beth mentioned in her opening remarks, the success of Medicare Advantage is really a testament to the hard work of advocates and policymakers you know, working together to strengthen it and improve the program for the 29 million beneficiaries who rely on it. So let's dive into some of the key findings, uh, starting with the enrollment trends um, and what we've seen uh, in the trends in this space over the past decade is that Medicare Advantage enrollment um, has nearly doubled over the past decade. And now 29 million uh, Medicare beneficiaries are enrolled in Medicare Advantage, um, which represents about 45% of the Medicare, med entire Medicare population. But uh, projections show that this growth is going to continue and very soon, perhaps as early as next year, Medicare Advantage enrollment is going to reach a key tipping point of um, oh, half of all Medicare beneficiaries. So alongside this growth in the program um, are other trends that I think are also noteworthy, particularly thinking about um, the increasing diversity of the Medicare Advantage population uh, since 2013. Enrollment in Medicare Advantage has grown over 111% among racial and ethnic minority beneficiaries, and by 125% among duly eligible beneficiaries, that is lower income uh, populations. Some of the other enrollment trends also uh, just want to touch on briefly is, of course, growth has been across the board, but employer waiver plans, as well as special needs plans have been uh, a key driver of this growth as well. And that's important both in the employer segment, that this is really a, an important option for retirees. And then for uh, special needs plans, you know, just an important coverage option um, for beneficiaries um, and, and providing care to some of the most vulnerable uh, Medicare beneficiaries. This map here uh, provides kind of a state-by-state -state look at enrollment. It's a companion to our State of Medicare Advantage report um, and encourage everyone to check out on our website. Um, it's an interactive map uh, where policymakers and stakeholders can really uh, do a deep dive in kind of the enrollment trends on a state-by-state -state and even uh, county and district level. So an important resource there. Taking a step back, looking at what is driving this, the increases in enrollment, and um, there's a number of factors at play. Certainly access to coverage and care um, is a key driver. Um, so, um, and the affordability for Medicare beneficiaries. So 98% of all Medicare beneficiaries now have access to a $0 uh, uh, plan. That is, they pay no premium, no additional premium beyond their Part B premium. And Medicare Advantage is also delivering uh, important uh, cost savings protections for beneficiaries. A report released earlier this year uh, found that Medicare Advantage beneficiaries save nearly 2,000 less on out-of-pocket costs and premiums annually compared to those enrolled in fee-for-service. Uh, it's important to note here that you know, lower-income Medicare beneficiaries um, have some of the, the steepest drops in out-of-pocket spending because of the patient protections that, um, that exist in Medicare Advantage and the core, coordinate, core care coordination model it provides. Next, I want to talk a little bit about um, the comprehensive benefits that Medicare Advantage offers as well. Uh, Medicare Advantage, of course, has to cover all Part A and Part B uh, benefits, but Medicare Advantage uh, covers additional benefits as well. And that is also a key driver of increases in enrollment. Uh, next slide, please. So comprehensive benefits is really just a crucial uh, value, part of the value of Medicare Advantage. You know, offering supplemental benefits is, is virtually universal. Uh, you know, offering uh, dental, vision, 
hearing benefits, but benefits that are not covered under fee for service, you know, is really an important uh, um, benefit for beneficiaries. Increasingly, uh, Medicare Advantage plans are also offering benefits that are really tailored to the needs of the patient population and going beyond just medical benefits, but really addressing uh, the social determinants of health and, and really looking at the whole health of, of the population. Because of regulatory and legislative flexibility over the past several years, uh, there's been a really a proliferation of these type of benefits, whether it's uh, special supplemental benefits for the chronically ill, whether it's through the VBID uh, flexibility, plans are really tailoring their benefits to really meet the needs uh, of, of Medicare beneficiaries, increasingly providing care and services in the home, uh, transportation uh, services for non-medical visits, uh, in-home support and uh, nutrition and, and home meal delivery. And so really important benefits not available in traditional uh, fee-for-service Medicare. And you know another key reason that's explaining uh, the tremendous growth in Medicare Advantage and its popularity. This slide touches on just the, the high patient satisfaction and quality that's associated with Medicare Advantage. And, uh, you know, the latest survey uh, report, 94% satisfaction rate with coverage, which is really, you know, extraordinarily high. And then within Medicare Advantage, uh, plans are evaluated on a number of clinical quality measures through the STAR ratings program. The latest report there showed that Medicare Advantage uh, star ratings were at their highest level ever recorded. 90% of beneficiaries are now enrolled in a plan that has four or more stars, and nearly a third of beneficiaries are enrolled in a, in a five-star plan. So the quality, the, the access to care uh, in Medicare Advantage you know, really stands out. Next slide, please. And before turning it back to Mary Beth and the panel, I would really want to underscore um, the importance of Medicare Advantage, its model, which is really focused on prevention, management of chronic conditions, and, and really the health of the whole person. Person is really critical to understanding how Medicare Advantage is delivering not only cost savings for beneficiaries, but improved patient outcomes. And though, so this slide really summarizes the literature in this area, uh, when, when you're, especially when you're looking at uh, Medicare beneficiaries with chronic condition, chronic conditions, Medicare Advantage is really delivering improved health for beneficiaries, including, you know, 43% lower rate of avoidable hospitalizations, 21% higher rate of seeing a physician, uh, and again, the, the um, record-breaking satisfaction. So with that, uh, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to my colleague, Mary Beth, and to kick off the panel discussion, which I'm looking forward to. Thanks a lot, Greg. <clears throat> um, all right, let me um, get going with our panel. Um, I want to first introduce Carla Radka, who Carla is joining us by phone, I believe. I think there were some technical issues. Um, for her joining by Zoom, which um, I apologize for. But do I have that right, Jonathan? And Carla, you're dialed in? Uh, yes, Mary Beth, we're just, um, let's see, I believe we do have Carla on the line. Um, Carla, if you can hear me, um, I think I've just sent a prompt to your phone um, to try to unmute you. Um, but we've, we've uh, selected the option. Oh, can you hear us, Carla? Yes, hi, good afternoon. Hi, great. good afternoon, everyone. Great. It's great to join this uh, amazing uh, panel and this great opportunity to inform and educate the audience. I am joining by phone, and I am very uh, glad to have the opportunity to be included on this panel this afternoon. Thank you, Carla. Um, and this is Mary Beth Donahue, President and CEO of Better Medicare Alliance, who will be um, right now welcoming everyone to the panel and introducing you all. And I'll be jumping in with questions after the introductions, but thank you. Carla is the president and CEO of the Senior Resource Alliance in Florida. Carla brings more than um, two decades of public service as an advocate, leader, change agent, including past leadership roles with the Goodwill Industries of Central Florida, Florida Family Care, and the Community-Based Care of Central Florida, which is a child welfare not-for-profit. 
Um, she also founded Public Allies Central Florida, which is a nationally recognized program and served as its executive director. Um, at the Senior Resource Alliance, Carla and her team help Central Florida seniors, their caregivers, and their families connect with the many state and federal service and programs available to them. Um, so thank you, Carla, for joining. And I'm just going to introduce um, Aaron and Sue, and then we'll get started. Um, as I mentioned, we're also joined by Sue um, Doherty. Um, Sue is the CEO of Metropolitan Area Neighborhood Nutrition Alliance. Many of you are familiar with this organization known as MANA. Sue joined MANA in 1999 as a registered dietitian nutritionist and was appointed as their CEO in 2012. Uh, she leads in uh, MANA, um, which provides um, all areas from ranging from hands-on cooking classes, nutrition counseling, to the delivery of three meals a day, seven days a week um, for seriously ill neighbors in the greater Philadelphia area, Southern New Jersey and surrounding areas. And the third member of our impressive panel is Aaron Gray, the founder and CEO of Find Help, uh, formerly known as Aunt Bertha, um, which is the nation's leading social care network, uh, which makes it easy for people seeking help to directly connect to local services and for customers in a wide range of industries to integrate social care into the work that they already do, uh, ranging from education and government to housing, healthcare, and more. Um, Aaron is a 2014 TED Fellow, um, an Unreasonable Institute Fellow, and most importantly, an advocate for the underserved in the United States. Um, so I'm going to just jump right into our questions. And I'm going to start with Sue. And I'll ask each of um, our panelists uh, a couple questions, and then I'm going to close with um, some rapid fire questions. And then um, I want to be able to turn to our audience um, for questions at the end. So Sue, starting with you, your organization, MANA, is doing such important work providing nourishment and healing to those most in need. And it just brings to mind the importance of supplemental benefits. Um, Greg touched on this um, in the State of Medicare Advantage report, um, focusing on nutrition and things like meal delivery and Medicare Advantage. And when we look at that report, we see nutrition and dietary benefit offerings in Medicare Advantage increased over 300% from 2021 um, to 2022 alone. And you know, with your knowledge experience, can you get um, put in per perspective what that means in the day-to-day -day lives of seniors and especially those who have serious illnesses? Sure. So first of all, I just want to thank you for having me. I'm to be joined by this incredible panel um, peers. So that's truly, I think, really telling, right? When you look at that percent in increase, I think it demonstrates and highlights the complexity of those that we're serving, right? As our client population is aging, they're also, also dealing with many, many chronic uh, health issues. And so access to healthy food is hard, right? People get prescribed medications all the time and they go to the pharmacy and they get their medicine or they get their medicine delivered. And people are prescribed complex diets all the time. And, you know, go follow a four gram potassium, four gram phosphorus, two gram sodium diet. And folks, you know, how do they access that? So I think what we hear all the time from the population that we're serving is that MANA, you know, we kind of see ourselves as the pharmacy for your prescription diet. And we're making sure people get the right nutrition to help with all the different health issues that they're, they're struggling with daily. And what we hear the most from the clients is the relief, right? That they don't have to stress what they're gonna eat, how they're gonna eat, is this right for, right for them? We remove that. And then obviously providing access to dietitians and providing education during the, the time they're on the program, I think is just critical to set them up for future success and sustainability. Well, and just as you, um, there's so many worries on seniors' minds, um, and to be able to try to alleviate some of those um, stresses, um, it's just to be able to be, you know, in a program like the Medicare Advantage program that talks about the value of those supplemental benefits that, you know, helps, you know, in addition to the healthcare coverage, um, so they have, you know, less than some of those stresses. 
you know, Sue, as we've talked about today, the supplemental benefits of Medicare Advantage, whether it is meal delivery, dental coverage, sharing benefits, or transportation to appointments, they're made possible by continued support and stability in Washington. Um, and, you know, if policymakers enacted cuts yeah. to seniors' Medicare Advantage coverage, supplemental benefits would be at risk. You know, what's your message to CMS, the agency that regulates Medicare Advantage, and congressional staff, um, those staff on Capitol Hill, as they weigh the, these decisions in the year ahead? To protect those benefits, right? They are critical to the whole person in care. And having the flexibility, as you mentioned, all the variety of services that folks may need, that truly is critical to the whole person care. And I think that starts with the social determinants of health, right? If you don't have transportation, you don't have housing, you don't have food, right? How I think showing up for a healthcare appointment is probably the furthest thing from your mind. So it really does start with the social determinants of health. And so protecting those supplemental benefits is key. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sue. Um, Thank you. I want to pivot to Carla. Um, you know, because as Sue talks about the need to protect these benefits and provide flexibility, I want to just um, dig a little bit into the beneficiary demographics. Um, you know, Carla, in the state of Medicare Advantage report that Greg highlighted, um, it looks at those beneficiary demographics in MA. And you touched on this in a recent op-ed in the Orlando Sentinel writing that patients with Medicare Advantage are on average older more ethnically diverse and from lower income households than traditional fee-for-service Medicare enrollees. Um, so Carla, as a leader of an organization that is directly serving Florida seniors, what do you think it is about Medicare Advantage that's attracting so many diverse beneficiaries? I think it's important to realize that when we are serving seniors in, uh, in, in, in our communities across the United States, the responsibilities of organizations such as Senior Resource Alliance is to protect and care for the most vulnerable members of our community. And in many cases, are those individuals, are those neighbors that have fall uh, under poverty guidelines, uh, that it comes from diverse background, either because of uh, origin, particularly uh, communities of color. And I think it's important to recognize that for those individuals, it's important to be able to uh, not only uh, uh, educate, but also educate in a way that is uh, understandable because of language barriers and because of uh, um, uh, you know, just limitations that they may have, uh, uh, vision impairment and, uh, and the need then, and then uh, dementia, maybe some signs of early dementia. So uh, we do have that incredible responsibility to be able to educate and inform and protect with compassion and care and with a good strategy that engage uh, leaders from all areas and all sectors in our communities across the US. Thank you, Carla. You know, you talk about compassionate care. You know, organizations like the Senior Resource Alliance are so important because of, as any of us with aging loved ones can attest, navigating federal programs like Medicare can be so confusing and we can't lose sight of the need to prioritize compassionate care in light of the confusing um, environment. And we believe Medicare Advantage can bring simplicity to many seniors by often providing integrating Part D coverage and added supplemental benefits in one um, low monthly bill. And in fact, most Medicare Advantage beneficiaries pay no added monthly premium um, at all. In what ways, Carla, have you seen Medicare Advantage bring relief to the seniors who visit your office? Well, definitely the fact that there is uh, no additional cost or very minimal cost is an advantage so that there can be additional income that it can go to cover other important needs uh, for seniors. Uh, we totally believe and we know that evidence uh, proven that having good nutrition, that uh, 
uh, be able to provide services that prevent social isolation, uh, that provide services that are related to mental health, are all uh, uh, benefits to be able to create better conditions and to age in place uh, for seniors in our communities. Uh, eventually, I would like to talk about one of the most important services where we promote this type of services in our organization, and I believe that that's the heartbeat of our work, and that's the Elder Helpline, uh, which is mandated under uh, the Older American Act, and that is the, the service that is at no cost to be able to have that lifeline, that information and referral that is available to seniors and caregivers at no cost in all our communities and to connect seniors and caregivers with the right resources and community, such as Medicare Advantage plans, such as resources and communities that provide safety nets to be able to uh, create livable communities and to uh, support seniors to age in place because we know that that is an important factor to be able to have a better quality of life and it's, uh, and it's important for the social determinants of health. Well, thank you, Carla. And thank you for mentioning that helpline because one of the areas I wanted to explore with Aaron is you know, the importance of reaching um, consumers, especially underserved consumers and how you know, were available to them. Um, you know, Aaron, you've been a champion of underserved consumers throughout your career. And that's the, one of the central purposes of Find Health, um, Find Help, excuse me. Um, and as you know, more than half of Medicare Advantage beneficiaries live below 200% of the poverty line. And enrollment in Medicare Advantage among those who are duly eligible for Medicaid, Medicaid increased 125% from 2013 to 2019. How can policymakers better reach these underserved consumers and what's the importance of Medicare Advantage to that effort? Thanks, thanks for the question. So what we do is when somebody, if you sort of take the policy out of it for a second, I want to provide just a real 30 second overview. Mm -hmm. um, for the family that's struggling or for the member that's struggling in any given moment, they don't know how to navigate the policy in those moments. And they may be covered by insurance, by Medicare Advantage, or, or, or they may not. Uh, what we built is uh, findhelp.org, which is the largest uh, social care referral network in the United States. And it works like a vertical search engine, meaning if you search for things in your zip code, it lets you know the available social services programs like food as medicine programs and other things that are philanthropically funded. And many of the health plans in the United States use findhelp.org as a way of finding social services and making referrals on behalf of their members um, um, that are out there. And in some cases, those referrals are you know, for a food pantry, depending on, on, on what can be covered under insurance and depending on what isn't covered under insurance. But other uh, referrals are, are made for things that are supplemental benefits under Medicare Advantage or value-added benefits under Medicaid. And so I think what's interesting and for policymakers to understand is that we now have, you know, our platform for existence uh, instance uh, crest 18 million users yesterday. And so um, we now be able to see where supply is not meeting demand. So we're now able to see seniors that can't find social services, but they may already be enrolled in, 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 in something like this and, and might qualify for supplemental benefit. So I think the point being though, is that allowing for flexibility for these health plans to make a decision to purchase something um, um, is possible now because of this information. Meaning, if if Mary is being navigated by a social worker with her, um, you know, social work, uh, sorry, being navigated with her social worker, well, they'll know what benefits she qualifies for. But in some cases, there might just be some flexibility. Meaning, they could recover um, at home instead of the nursing home. But the only thing that's keeping them from doing that is the fact that there's no wheelchair ramp um, on her house. Um, I think the point being is that with the availability of information, it allows far more flexibility in allowing these folks to just pay for services um, uh, if it's medically necessary. And, and I think that just gives a little bit more tools in the toolkit that wasn't around 20 years from now, but is around now. And so I'm not speaking as a policy expert, but as an expert that knows 
that in real time, you can find out if somebody in need that is enrolled in Medicare Advantage needs something. And the question then becomes is, is there enough flexibility to get that need fulfilled when there isn't a nonprofit or you know, a, a safety net um, service that out there in the community can fulfill it for free? Mm -hmm. Well, and when you, Aaron, when you talk about, you know, seniors who can't, you know, find those social services and, you know, you speak to the role that you play in that, you know, Find Help connects users um, to all kinds of services, food pantries, housing advice, repairs, job placement, financial assistance, so much more. Um, you know, in, in many ways, your company is helping to solve um for those social determinants of health that account for you know half of the health outcomes, and you know we've heard from Sue and um, Carla that reference to social determinants of health, you know, and as you know that's a real focus of Medicare Advantage, and it's why so many Medicare Advantage plans are now offering pest service um, services, in-home repairs, grocery shopping, prescription you know drop off. You know, can you speak to the progress that you've been able to see over time in social determinants of health and how it's been addressed in Medicare Advantage, um, but at the same time, what barriers still remain? Sure. Well, you know, it used to be that health insurance plans were, were basically just processing claims. Um, and, you know, we've been doing this work for 12 years now, and what we've seen is more and more health plans hire care coordinators by the tens of thousands. Um, we, we happen to train many of them because we work with about 130 health plans nationwide. Um, and what those care coordinators are doing is they're asking their members to fill out assessments. And in those assessments, they're learning about needs like uh, the things that are barriers for thriving at uh, aging in place at home, uh, maybe food insecurity and other things. So what's happening is uh, the health plans are now 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 at least they know about it, which is which is a good step um, on a per member basis because of the investments that have been made in hiring these care coordinators. Um, and we've seen that become more and more ubiquitous. It isn't everywhere, but it is more and more ubiquitous now. The question then becomes is, okay, if you do know about a need, how do you give somebody that extra last mile delivery of services? Now, in some cities, um, the supply is there, but in many rural communities, there's no options, meaning there is no Meals on Wheels that can go deliver mm -hmm. food. And, you know, um, and, and so what do you do with the sober reality that many Americans, especially in rural communities, don't have local philanthropy to help them uh, live and and um, with dignity, you know, and and they're just the options just aren't there, and so I think what I'm seeing evolve is that health plans and public policy through 1115 waivers and other things are now presenting options so that um, these organizations can now pay for a service, and you know there is an exterminator in in some of these small towns, and there is somebody who can build a wheelchair ramp, um, but it, they need to get paid. You know, and, and so that's, I think, the, the real difference. So we're seeing a desire to do it. We're seeing some funding for it and uh, flexibility. And y'all are more experts than we are on the funding streams. But I think the, the sober reality is, is we see the real-time demand every single day for these types of services done by the hundreds of thousands of care coordinators that are using our platform. We have to accept the fact that there isn't enough charity um, in these situations. And the question then becomes, what do you do about it? Well, thank you, Aaron and um, Sue and Carla, thank you. And we, we do have, we wanna leave some questions to the audience, but we have a few minutes here where I'm gonna do a bit of rapid fire um, if you're open to it. And just some questions to throw out to the three of you and you know, jump in um, on the answers here. Um, if you could tell our audience here, you know, many of whom are congressional staff, one thing about Medicare Advantage, what would it be? It works. If this is Carla Bradka. I would say that if you have one thing that you can uh, learn a, a takeaway about Medicare Advantage plans, I would say uh, be informed and reach out to our organization through the Elder Helpline. We can connect you with experts that provide unbiased advice through our SHINE program to be able to 
help you navigate this complicated work and world at times of Medicare to be able to connect you with the best resources that best fit the needs for your own health care to take control and to take leadership in terms of the best choice uh, for your particular situation. All right, Aaron. I, you know, I, I, from what I know about it, it's flexible. Um, okay. What tangible action um, with, again, with congressional staffers um, listening in here, um, should they take um, in their offices to support MA beneficiaries? I, I would just ride the theme out, give the plans more flexibility to purchase things on behalf of people who are struggling, you know, if it's medically necessary. I would agree that flexibility. Mm -hmm. You agree with flexibility, Carla? Anything to add? Added benefits and, uh, and, and the value added of uh, uh, benefits that it can really be uh, change makers and 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 uh, uh, additional services that it can enhance the quality of life. So value added. And in closing, what is um, Medicare Advantage community's greatest need from policymakers in this moment? I, I would say to to protect it, right? And to protect and again, it's like we're broken records, right? But leaving the flexibility, making it more about the keeping it about the individual and that whole person care and being able to think outside of the box and provide, you know, treatment or provide whatever your definition of treatment is, the, the needs for that individual and protecting the whole person care. Carla, Aaron? I'll defer to others just um, uh, on this one. But I think it, it's it, important it, to, yeah. No, 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 I, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I think just to sort of understand that uh, there's rare opportunities for public-private partnerships that are effective. And, um, and it, I, I think um, there's a best of both worlds effect that um, happens with this particular program. I, I study the history of the safety net, you know, especially Great Society and other things, and, and the flexibility and the public-private partnership that exists today didn't exist, you know, back then. All right. Well, Aaron, Sue, Carla, thank you so much for your time, um, sharing your knowledge, and just all um, that you're contributing um, to the Medicare Advantage community and the seniors that um, we're trying to strengthen and protect this program for. So thank you. So Jonathan, I'm going to turn to you. I believe that we have some questions from the audience for our panel. So um, we want you all to stay close. Great. Thanks, Mary Beth. And uh, just a reminder for our audience, uh, you can still ask a question uh, using the Q&A function on your screen. I know we've already got a few uh, here in the queue, so we'll go ahead and get started with those. Uh, the first question says, is there any insight you can offer to what seems to be a new grocery benefit for Medicare Advantage members? Um, I, I know, Greg, you, you and I, um, uh, you were saying you may have some thoughts to share on this. Yes, appreciate the question. Um, there's some research from uh, our colleagues at Milliman who've been cataloging kind of the various uh, proliferation of, uh, you know, non-medical benefits um, in nutrition and food. Uh, and you're right that there has been an increase as far as, uh, you know, grocery and meal delivery um, fr from just last year, 78 plans to 87 plans now. Uh, cover that benefit, and, and that benefit covers uh, nearly 3 million Medicare Advantage beneficiaries. So uh, good question there. Um, we've got another question, just um, sticking on the theme of, of some of the, the research that we've done here at BMA, asking, is there any data on the outcomes of those enrolled in Medicare Advantage? If not, when will that be available? Appreciate the question there. Yeah, there's been uh, a number of research studies uh, that have really looked at this uh, in, in quite a lot of depth. 
uh, including two studies from Avalier, one from 2018, one from 2020. The, the most recent one really focused on high cost, high need beneficiaries, and really shows uh, very compellingly, you know, um, improved outcomes really across the board, whether you're looking at reduced emergency room visits, fewer preventable hospitalizations, uh, more access to preventive care. Um, and so we're happy to make that available, uh, those reports um, after this webinar. We've got a question from Ken who says, are home paramedics in Metro Orlando discover hoarding, unsafe housing, and even squatters moving in with seniors? How are Medicare Advantage plans discovering mm -hmm. issues that seniors are hesitant to disclose uh, on the phone or in surveys? Hi, uh, this is Carla Bradka. So through our uh, intake and referrals, uh, through our operations, we have uh, compassionate, caring, professional counselors that complete assessments with seniors. Uh, and through that relationship, they are able to establish trust to be able to get to the, the critical issues that some seniors are facing. Uh, what we have learned is that, that that incredible dignity that is part of uh, that generation that, that we're uh, serving right now, the seniors, is um, protecting their own dignity, their own personal space. So to get to that space where we have to uh, get into the disclosure of critical needs like homelessness or uh, uh, issues with hunger or uh, personal issues where they might be facing neglect, endangerment or abandonment, um, are, are issues that are addressed through our intake and referrals to be able then to put plans, care plans, where we can support seniors and refer them to the right resources. Another thing that I would like to say is the incredible partnerships that we have in the community to be able to serve from law enforcement, from healthcare, from partner organizations and providers in our region to be able to create those safety nets that support seniors and caregivers in our communities. That's an outstanding question, and 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 we can't underestimate that fear of of being embarrassed and asking for help and sharing the intimate situations that that the uh, the the person that asked the question asked in, in the Orlando area because it is it is real, and so there there's a fear of sharing that on the phone with your care coordinator at your health plan. So um, we work with our health plans to also provide an anonymous way of searching for help and then beginning the process of applying for help. And so sometimes people will find a service to help with uh, needs that they might be embarrassed about. Maybe they were independent for much of their lives and, and they, they're worried about the judgment or the stigma that's associated um, with some of their current needs that are there. Um, and so sometimes people will go ahead and apply if they're certainly internet savvy um, <clears throat> for things before they speak to somebody. And that gets them into the pipeline for getting enrolled in some of these types of benefits. And so it, it's so important to recognize that the stigma still exists. Um, and so even though the resources are there, it takes a lot of courage to raise your hand and say, you know, gosh, I, I can't feed my, myself right now, you know. We've got a, a question from William just asking uh, for those who were late, will there be an opportunity to listen to this session afterwards? Um, uh, yes, w William, we will be uh, uh, putting the video of this on bettermedicarealliance.org. Uh, if you go to our website, there's an events tab at the top right of the page. And uh, we hope to have all of this, th this, this video and all of this loaded uh, up there by this time tomorrow. Um, so with that, um, I believe, Mary Beth, we can... Uh, we can transition to the closing. Terrific. Um, well, thank you, Jonathan, for uh, managing this portion of the program. And thank you, Greg. And greatly appreciate our panel, Carla, Aaron, Sue. It was great to spend this time with you. And thank you for stepping in and sharing your knowledge here and look forward to engaging with you all again. And really appreciate the engagement with our audience um, and the questions you have, and we'll follow up on the um, hospice uh, benefit question and any other follow-up that you all may have. And um, please
please stay in touch with us and we look forward to your ongoing um, advocacy of MA. Um, let us know where we can be helpful and we'll talk and hopefully see everyone soon. We'll be having our October Medicare Advantage Summit. So you'll be hearing from us on that soon.